so that we'll have the opportunity for questions and comments. And just as we did in the other room, we have a microphone. Uh, and uh, again, the same thing I would ask of you in this room, that if, in fact, you have a comment or a question for the ambassador, uh, that you would uh, stand, identify yourself, wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, we're trying to have a transcript of this entire proceedings. Uh, and then uh, state your name and your affiliation so that the ambassador will know who you are. Uh, it, it has already been mentioned on at least two or three occasions this morning in our panels, uh, a reference to the Arab view. Uh, the Arab view. And many of our speakers and commentators have characterized the Arab view. I would suggest that we have yet to hear the Arab view, but we are about to. Uh, His Excellency, Dr. Hussein, Asuna is the ambassador of the League of Arab States to the United States. He received his LLB and his PhD in international law at Cambridge University in England, and during his distinguished career, has lectured at major universities in the United States, and Canada, and England, and France, including such competitive institutions as Yale, Georgetown, UCLA, McGill in Canada, Cambridge, and the Sorbonne, and now Ambassador at Duke. Prior to his current posting, the Ambassador has had a tremendously distinguished diplomatic career. He was a member of the Permanent Mission of Egypt to the United Nations in New York from 1971 to 1976, his first time to be posted in this country. He then was a special advisor to the Egyptian foreign minister on legal and international organization affairs from 1976 to 1978. He was the political counselor at the Egyptian embassy in Washington, his second posting to the United States from 1978 until 1982. He was the director of the Egyptian press and information bureau in Paris from 1983 until 1986. He was the director of cabinet to the deputy prime minister and minister of foreign affairs of Egypt from 1986 to 1989. He was the ambassador of Egypt to Yugoslavia from 1989 to 1992. He was the ambassador of Egypt to Morocco from 1992 until 1996. He was the assistant minister of foreign affairs of Egypt for international legal affairs and treaties from 1996 until 1997, and most recently, before assuming his current posting, he was the ambassador of the League of Arab States to the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our keynote luncheon speaker, His Excellency Dr. Hussein Hassouna. Ambassador? Since 
in my long diplomatic career with the Egyptian Foreign Service and then with the League of Arab States, I have been involved in many of the issues which I will talk about today. I was one of the first Egyptian diplomats who have accompanied President Sadat of Egypt when he went on this historic trip to Jerusalem in November of 77. This was a turning point in the Arab-Israeli problem, and it opened the way for peace, a difficult peace, but eventually a lasting peace, I do hope. I was also one of the last diplomats to go to Baghdad last year and to meet together with my boss, the Secretary General of the Arab League, with the Iraqi leadership, with President Saddam Hussein, and to urge them to renew their contacts with the United Nations and to accept the return of the inspectors to Baghdad which they did eventually in September of last year. So first, before dealing with the issue of Iraq, which I guess is the main theme of the conference, I'd like to put, to put it in, in context, in perspective. And I'd like to give you my impression about the world order we're living in today. And then I will deal with the regional order in the Arab world before dealing with the question of Iraq. Well, I think we all realize that since the end of the Cold War, we live in a world where there has been a dramatic proliferation of wars, civil wars mainly, and regional wars. And unfortunately, the main victims of those wars have been the civilian population. And you can see this today in the Middle East, in Iraq, where there were many civilians killed, and also in Palestine, when there are still many civilians killed on a daily basis. The second feature which I would refer to is the question of a, an erosion in the traditional concept of state sovereignty. And you find new theories like humanitarian intervention or the question of international criminal responsibility. They all affect the traditional concept of, of sovereignty. I think those new notions are still uh, at the beginning and they, they have to be defined. They have to rest on some clear and objective criteria. Another main feature, I think, of the world order is the unchallenged supremacy of the United States in the world today. I think this supremacy that was alluded to in many discussions this morning gives the United States a special role, but also confirms on the United States special responsibilities. And I think that the military might of the United States has to be combined with political leadership and moral leadership if it wants to have the world follow, follow its leadership. And I think if you go back to the national security strategy of the United States, you'll find that the United uh, States is mentioned as the only uh, superpower today, uh, but that there is also a recognition that it is a vulnerable <coughs> power because it has an open society. And it also refers to the need of the United States to have friends and allies. And this is, this is extremely important, which sometimes people forget. The other feature, I think, of, of the world order is the collective security system that was established under the Charter was based on 
the agreement or consensus of the five permanent members. And this has recently witnessed a major crisis and has been undermined because I think the United States and the United Kingdom have resorted to a unilateral approach to deal with the, with the question of, of, the, of the weapons of mass destruction and of regime change in, in Iraq. There has been a great controversy if, if this action was legal or not. In my personal view, the reference to previous resolutions under the ceasefire that allowed such action, or to the resolution of 1441 that talked of, of serious consequences or material breach, all these references might give an argument to justifying the war on a legal basis. But I think what is more important is to be reminded that the Security Council is the, or is the organ that adopted the resolutions. And it is only the Security Council, from a legal point of view, who has the power to interpret those resolutions. And I think if you go back to the long debates that have happened, trying to issue another resolution, before the war started, you will realize that the majority of the member states did not accept this argument. And if you agree then that you have to take into account the position of the majority, I think this resort to force was unjustified. The other feature of, I think, the international scene is that today we have global problems. <coughs> Questions of weapons of mass destruction, the uh, organized crime, the, the uh, drugs, the uh, global terrorism, the environment, these are all global issues which can only be resorted and confronted through global efforts and global solutions. So again, <coughs> this brings me to, back to underline the central role of the United Nations, which again this morning was a bit downgraded, but I think that the United Nations is and will remain the main forum for settling the global issues which the world is facing today. And no country alone, however powerful, can deal with those issues because they affect us all. I will mainly now talk about the regional uh, order in the Middle East. Here you have big problems, problems of peace, problems of security, problems of human development. And here I would only say that from the Arab perspective, the Arab-Israeli problem remains in the hearts and minds of the people in the Middle East the main issue. And again, I will disagree with those who this morning were saying that we can bypass this problem it can be marginalized. This is the, the oldest conflict that exists in the Middle East. It has shaped the perspective. It is, it is the ground for potential terrorism. And I think that to, to say that it, it hasn't got importance is, is not only neglecting that their daily lives lost among Palestinians, among Israelis, among Arabs, and that human lives are precious. But I think in the long run, it is a destabilizing force in the region, 
and it has to be addressed. Once and for all, there must be a solution to that problem. It cannot be marginalized. The problem of Iraq is a problem that is linked to the Arab-Israeli problem. And, and the fact that the Iraqi problem took such importance uh, in, 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 in the last years, and, and especially in the last uh, maybe few months, had an effect on the Arab-Israeli problem because it was overshadowed. It was neglected. But now that Iraq is about to be settled, I think it's about time to go back. And President Bush has promised that he is personally committed to carry out the roadmap which has been prepared by the Quartet, that his vision of, of a two-state solution has to be realized and that at least we have to address this problem once and for all if we want a stable uh, and peaceful Middle East. So I think it, it's, it's extremely important for, for this problem to be addressed. The Arab position on the Arab-Israeli problem is that we have to rely on the very important initiative which was put forward by the Arab world. That this is at the last summit meeting in Beirut of last year. The Arab world, upon a proposal of, of uh, Prince Abdullah of uh, Saudi Arabia, has unanimously, and I say unanimously, including Iraq and Libya, has endorsed the Arab Peace Initiative, which calls for the entering of the Arab world in peaceful diplomatic relations with Israel on the understanding that Israel would, would withdraw from all the territories it has occupied since 1967 and that a just solution of the Palestinian refugee problem should be achieved. So this is the Arab position and I think it has not been uh, focused enough and, and it has been overlooked and neglected and I think we have to come back to it because in the long term this is the hope for the Arab and the Israelis to live together and, and, and to achieve a peaceful <coughs> Middle East. And again for those who, who neglect I think the importance of this issue I would just remind them that a few years ago there was the beginning of focusing on, on creating a, uh, a Middle East where there would be cooperation between the Arab world and, and Israel, economic cooperation, cultural cooperation. I attended some of those meetings in, in, uh, in Morocco when I was ambassador of Egypt there, and it, there was so much hope for that for the first time we could have a new Middle East. All this hope, of course, now has vanished, but that is why we have to really re renew the peace process and, and reach a, a just and, and lasting settlement. The question of democratization is another issue in the Middle East. The, the position of the Arab world is that, yes, we are not perfect. Yes, we need more demo democratization. But democratization has to come from within our societies, according to our history, our tradition, and our values. It cannot be imposed from the outside. It will not work. The question of human development, yes, again, there was an important report prepared by the UNDP of the United Nations together with the League of Arab States, because the League of Arab States felt that it was important to show to the Arab world what the positive aspects and the negative aspects of human developments were and to address those issues. And this is a new kind of self-criticism to our societies which should be encouraged and not condemned as sometimes we hear it uh, among different uh, groups. I think the, the other question is the question of weapons of mass destruction and here of course we take a strong view against the weapons of Iraq, but equally we say that we want to create in the Middle East a zone free of weapons of mass destruction. Whoever owns them, 
And this includes the weapons of mass destruction possessed by Israel. Let me now quickly go into the question of Iraq, which is, which is linked to what I've said already. And here I would say that the position of the League of Arab States and the Arab world before the war started was that we should exert all efforts in order to avert this war. Why? Because of, of the consequences of this war. The consequences for Iraq, the consequences for the region. And they have been already tremendous, the consequences, in terms of economic loss. A country like Egypt has lost so much revenue in, 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 in tourism, in investment. The rates of the insurance has gone up. The passage through the Suez Canal has been affected. So has been already, and this is just one example. I'm not talking about Jordan. I'm not talking about, about Syria, about the whole region. And we thought we should give the inspectors a chance. And again today I heard, of course, many people and some very competent people say that uh, we've given them a chance 12 years. I think that during these 12 years, they have produced results in the 90s. And there has been a lot of disarmament going on. And at the beginning of this year, we reached a stage where for the first time, the Iraqis were being really cooperative with the inspectors. It, for many reasons, in my way. One of them was maybe because the whole Arab world was urging them to be more cooperative. And I said, the, the, the Arab League, we went last year to Baghdad, we met them and we told them, if you have nothing to hide, open your doors. You have to prove that you are clean. Well, the other maybe reason might be the, the military buildup. But the fact is that we have seen, before the war started, actual disarmament happening for the first time. We have seen the Iraqis destroying missiles, which they have built with a longer range than the one uh, allowed under, under the United Nations. We also have seen them allowing many of the scientists to be interviewed. So we've seen some progress. And we will not say to the world, well, let's forget about that. We were saying, give it more time. And Hans Blix and Mohammed Baradi, those who on the ground saw what was happening and could evaluate more than anyone else, more than Security Council, that is unfortunately a political body. Those were saying we need maybe a few more weeks or a few more months. Well, it didn't happen. I think history would judge this decision was right. But when the war started, the position of the Arab world was we have to stop this war as soon as we can. People used to look at their TV screens every night and see the casualties, the pounding of the Iraqi cities and the innocent people paying a price. The, the people of Iraq have suffered. They had already the Iraqi Iranian war, then they were faced with the 1990 one war and now this war. And in between, they were subject to some crippling sanctions imposed by the United Nations against them. So this has provoked a feeling of compassion in the Arab world for them, of solidarity. And the issue of leadership has been, in a way, put aside. But what are we seeing now? I think now we are about to see the end of uh, the crisis if this war comes to a conclusion. We have always wanted a, a fast end to this war. We hope that, looking to the future, that certain principles will be observed and, and respect it in order to 
make sure that the after Iraq scenario will be one of, of stability and not instability and more terrible. So first of all, we in the Arab world would like to preserve the unity and territorial integrity of Iraq. It's extremely important. Iraq is a country of great importance in the Arab world. It, it has a great history. It was at one point the capital of the, uh, of the Muslim empire. And it has to regain its role as a country that is not divided. It's not divided in an ethnic group, uh, in sections of religious, uh, that the neighbors uh, don't try to extract some of its parts. The second worry we have is that Iraq must remain for the Iraqis. And the Iraqis should rule themselves according to their own choice and own will. There can be no imposed system on them. Uh, we also think that the resources of Iraq should remain to the Iraqi people. The third, I think, element is that we believe that the United States that has led this war, the coalition, has to undertake a great effort to change its image. The United States was always perceived in the Arab world as a country that defended freedom, the principles of self-determination, and, and liberty. And this goes back to the principles enunciated by Woodrow Wilson at the beginning of this century. Also in 1956, when France and, and the United Kingdom, together with Israel, invaded Egypt to the United States, who stood up against its own allies in defense of the principles of liberty and the independence of each country. So I think the United States image has been that, maybe wrongly, that it is, it went to Iraq, not just for the weapons of mass destruction, it went to, to, to Iraq for a real change, for getting a foothold in Iraq, for controlling maybe the, the wealth of the region, and as a result, it is being perceived as a colonial power. So I think it's very important how the United States is going to deal with the aftermath of this war, that it shows itself compassionate, sensitive to the feelings of, of the people in Iraq and of the Arab world, that, that it shows that it is there to help and not to conquer or dictate its own vision. So I think this is very important. And here I would say that it is important for the United Nations to be reinvolved for many reasons. The United Nations has to be reinvolved to, prefer, to, pre, to uh, confer some legitimacy on, on, on the whole situation. It has to, to be involved to, uh, to, to help through its experience the, the Iraqi people. It has to be involved because at one point it will have to recognize the new government of Iraq. At one point it has to lift the sanctions, which means that again there must be an agreement between the uh, the, the permanent members, and I think the involvement of the United Nations also will help in, in healing the rift between the different parties uh, in, this, in, in the Security Council. So I think that uh, we still fear that the problem of Iraq is not settled. We might have seen some, big, some military victories, but what counts is the long-term consequences for the people of Iraq and, and for, the, for, the, for the whole region. And still we might see some instability, we might see some civil strife, we might uh, feel a lot, a lot of problems might still emerge. So just to conclude, I, I know that you, you want to leave time for questions. Uh, I think if you look into the future, we will see that, in, in my view at least, is at a crossroads today. Either we achieve stability in Iraq 
and we put Iraq back on on the basis of, of, of a strong country, a country where people can live again in peace and security, where their nightmare is over, and where they can evolve gradually and democratically. And we can also have progress on the Palestinian problem, and then also on the larger Arab-Israeli problem, because we still have the uh, issue of uh, Syria and South Lebanon and so on, where, by the way, the United Nations has over the years played a very important role. Again, I'm trying to reply to those who think the United Nations is insignificant. Were it not the peacekeeping forces in Golan, in, in southern Lebanon, in the Sinai Peninsula, along the Iraqi um, Kuwaiti border, there might have been more crises and more explosions. So we have to, again, con concentrate on the Arab-Israeli problem and to, to find a just solution. I think uh, the coming months and, and the coming period is therefore of, of crucial importance to everyone. And we cannot, again, settle those problems unless we do it jointly. It has to be done by the United Nations, it has to be done by, by the United States, the leading power in the world, it has to be done also by the countries of the region. And uh, I, I do hope and I pray uh, that we will succeed, because I think the stake is too serious and too uh, costly if we do fail. Thank you very much. my prerogative, not only as the conference organizer, but also the chair of the last panel, and suggest, sir, that uh, we can slip the start of that panel for 15 or 20 minutes, because I think it is extremely important that we allow for at least five or 10 minutes of questions. And I would, I would remind you again that if you have a question or comment, uh, we have a wireless microphone. Where do you have that on? Uh, if you have a question for the ambassador, or if you would wait for the microphone to come, and uh, we'll try to entertain as many of your questions as possible. Uh, I guess Michael has the first one. Um, Michael Byers, uh, Duke University. I want to ask for your advice to the French government at the moment, uh, because I think they have a very difficult choice to make in the next couple of weeks. They obviously want the United Nations to be heavily involved in the reconstruction of Iraq, and therefore want a Security Council resolution. But they also know that any resolution that is acceptable to the United States and the United Kingdom would provide ground for an argument that that resolution retro retroactively authorized the war in Iraq. I see it as an almost intractable choice. Does the French government compromise its position on the legality of the war by agreeing to the resolution in order to bring the United Nations back in? Or does it stand its ground and effectively concede to the United States the unilateral administration of Iraq? I appreciate your views not only as an ambassador, but also as a distinguished international lawyer. Well, I, I think you give to the French too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I went first to a French school, so I know them very well when I lived in, in France. And the view they, they take is, is not just French. I think they reflect the view of a number of countries in the United Nations. And, and I think even 
people, some people in this country might, might agree with the view. So it's not, we shouldn't be obsessed with, with, with France as such, you know, which I feel sometimes people are. Uh, I think that uh, we, we should not go back to the question of legality of war, because the war has taken place, and there are different interpretations, I think. Uh, but I think we, we should get the United Nations involved, and, and in my view, in, in different phases, and aspects we are facing, we are facing the question of, of uh, the humanitarian role, role of the United Nations, the question of reconstruction of Iraq, and also, I think to a certain degree, in the question of the, the transitional uh, <coughs> period, you know, and uh, authority. And I think United Nations can, can, can play a role in all, all those different uh, aspects and phases. The question is that any involvement of the United Nations has to be through a Security Council resolution. The Security Council resolution defines the legal framework for the involvement of the United Nations. You cannot do it otherwise. You cannot uh, have it involved on a, on a, on a sort of uh, friendly basis or this, this, is, this is how everything must have a legal context, as many lawyers, of course, would, would, would agree with. So you have to go back to Security Council, and, and I don't think it's, it's impossible to reach. I think the Security Council, as I said, I lived many years in the United Nations, and I know how it works. It's a political body. And if you have the political will, you will, you will reach an agreement. If you don't have the political will, then there, you will find that there are all kinds of legal obstacles, uh, uh, and, and, and you will say it's, 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 it's irreconcilable. No, I think, I think that, for my part, I feel that the United States needs to go back to the United Nations. It, need, it needs to go back to multilateralism, because it cannot assume responsibility of, of future Iraq uh, alone not only financially, but even politically and, and otherwise. And I think it's also for, the, for France, for, for Germany, for the, for the rest of the, of the world, again, to, to agree with the United States, because there is a new situation on the ground. It concerns everyone. And as I said, it needs global efforts uh, and joint efforts. So eventually, I think there will be a resolution adopted by the Council on what basis, how we can reach some, some compromise. Uh, but I think it will be on the ground that we should avoid the question if, if the resort to force was, was legal or not legal, and, and look into the future. So this is uh, as much as I, I can uh, respond to your question. Thank you for being here, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Randy Cook. I'm from Duke University School of Law. Um, I have first a, a, a statement that I, I hope you'll, I'd like to hear your response to, and then I'd like to follow up with a question. Um, the statement is that if the, um, the, re, the aftermath of the, the current war is indeed benign, uh, and I, I recognize that that's a, that's a key if, and, and if benign, I'll, I'll define that as the emergence of, in Iraq, a, a st stable uh, civic institutions, a, a uh, improving material uh, conditions for the population, no longer under, under conditions of sanctions, um, an improving military situation or, or st stability situation in the Middle East with, with the uh, passage of the need for the U.S. to maintain sort of containing forces in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, um, and also the um, the other benign condition, I suppose, would be the, legitima the legitimation and sort of acceptance of this emerging uh, reality or emerging um, regime in Iraq. If, if those things all came together, couldn't the, this war well be the, um, I suppose, the, uh, the greatest thing in terms of solving the Israeli-Palestinian uh, or Arab problem uh, and, and solving the, the irritants that lead to that uh, that we've seen in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, and then, so that's my, my, my statement. My question is, um, 
how can, I, I'd be interested in commenting on, on or in hearing your, um, your thoughts on how the Arab Union proposes to respond to the emerging uh, administration of uh, Iraq following, following uh, this, this initial uh, phase of implementation, and, and in particular how Egypt, uh, if, you, if you could speculate on how Egypt might, might uh, embrace or, or try to, to uh, create a new, a new uh, status quo or equilibrium in, in the uh, Middle East region. Well, I think, I think it, 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 uh, in response to your question, it all depends how it unfolds. Uh, if, if, if the war ends up uh, with, with not too many casualties, if, if the United States gets back to the United Nations, if, if, if it allows the Iraqis to, uh, to, to choose their own representatives, to set up their own uh, structures and, and govern themselves, if the United States does not try to, 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 to stay there as an occupying power, because this, this, if, if, if the United States tries, for, for whatever reason, to, to remain in Iraq as an occupying power, this will breed resistance in the long term. Uh, any occupation breeds resistance. This is the lesson of history. And, uh, and, and then it might lead to radicalizing the whole region. And then it will be much more difficult, I think, to address the Arab-Israeli problem and to find a, a solution. So, but you, you, your assumption was that this wouldn't happen. <coughs> that we would have a settlement, that the United States would not stay one hour more than is needed, would, would hand over the, the, the government or the authority to, to the people of Iraq. So if this happens, I think we can, we can then focus on, on, on other issues, the question of Palestine and the Israeli problem. And, and Egypt, you said, uh, the perception of Egypt is that it, it wants a, a stable Iraq. And, and uh, if, if there is a genuine new government, uh, it will be accepted by the Arab world as such. But if it's a controversial government, and uh, it, 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 is, it is picked uh, among maybe leaders that are controversial, that don't really reflect the, 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 the general population, then it will be much more difficult to be accepted and to, to join the Arab League and so on. And here I would say that we need to, to find leaders not only who come from, from abroad. Uh, I am amazed sometimes that people talk about the Iraqi opposition who has been living for over 40 years abroad and then they, they claim that they have some legitimacy in running the country. I think you have to find leaders from within, from within the society, people who have lived through all these difficult years. People, leaders who have credibility. I think this is, this is more important. So if we achieve in getting those leaders, leaders to, uh, to form their own government, uh, I think this government will be accepted, and, and then we can hope for uh, for progress uh, in, in another issue in the Middle East. Because the ambassador will be with us this afternoon and this evening and will be available for other comments and questions, uh, I'm going to allow one more question uh, this afternoon. And uh, Will, I guess, uh, Will Curtis, Dr. Will Curtis. And then we'll close. Uh, Dr. Will Curtis, U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, sir, I want to uh, extend my appreciation to for uh, interacting with us in this way because I think it's important. I, I have a two-part question and that it requires short answers. Okay. Number one is that I think uh, the perception of the role of the Arab League in this country is not fully understood. So number one, I'd like to know uh, what has, and this may be going in the past, what exactly has the members of the Arab League done to alleviate the poverty and the plight of Palestinians. And, and secondly, you, you seem to uh, stress U.S. actions, coalition action, and uh, U.N. actions in regards to uh, post uh, Saddam Hussein uh, 
stability in the region. What role do you see for the Arab League in those two areas? Thank you. Well, first, first of all, uh, concerning the, the the role of the Arab League, uh, I think uh, you're right. I think the Arab League is not known in this country, uh, and uh, I think maybe the mistake is uh, both on people here who are not maybe interested enough in in our structures and. And, and issues, and maybe it's also on the Arab League who doesn't do enough to explain what it does. Uh, I would be very happy to give you all the information on the Arab League. May, may I just tell you that the Arab League is the oldest regional organization in the world. It was created in March of 1945, even before the United Nations. Uh, I also want to tell you that there is no major decision or policy that was adopted in the Arab world without being adopted within the framework of the Arab League. For instance, the question I was just, just mentioning, the, the policy of uh, the Arab Peace Initiative that was adopted in Beirut was an Arab League summit. The question of establishing an economic free trade zone in the Middle East, this was an Arab League uh, decision. The, we have a declaration on environment. Um, the, the, the latest initiative of the Arab League was the creation of an, an Arab organization on, on the status of, of the woman, the Arab woman, in order to promote its role in, in Arab society. So all major initiatives, the question of creating a zone free of all weapons of mass destruction, all those initiatives were adopted in the Arab League. So it, it has importance, it has great importance to the region. Maybe people don't, don't know about it. Um, your, your, your other question was, what can the Arab world do to, uh, to help in the post-Iraq, uh, post-war Iraq? I think they can do a lot. They can do by helping the Iraqi people. And already there was a meeting this week in Kuwait, uh, attended by the Gulf Cooperation Council, and they addressed the, the needs of the, of the Arab countries to step up and help the people of Iraq, who have been the main victims of the war, uh, financially, uh, maybe in other ways, educationally, uh, in, 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 in many ways they can help. And uh, again, I think if there is a representative government in Iraq, all the Arab countries will accept this government and, and, and work and improve relations and develop uh, a lot of, uh, of, of very, very fruitful relations with it. So I think the, the, it might change also the atmosphere in the region because, as someone said this morning, I think the Gulf region has experienced so much tension uh, over the years because of the different wars. So once, once we have, again, peace and we have a stable Iraq, I think that there would be a completely different atmosphere that when can really promote cooperation uh, between the, the Arab world and, and Iraq. And I just want to end up by saying that whatever I have said in my speech that was maybe uh, not completely in conformity with the policy of the United States, I, I, I said it as a friend of the United States because I believe that we need good relations, that we have many common interests. And people, when they talk about the Arab world, they only talk about the problems of the Arab world. They talk about the, the problem of Iraq, the problem of Palestine, of, uh, of, of terrorism that came from the Arab world, but they forget the tremendous common interests we have. Not only do we have strategic interests, political interests, but the economic interests are enormous. The volume of trade is <coughs> over $70 billion. The investments from the Arab world in this country, over $200 billion. So I think it's about time to, to focus on our common problems, our common interests. Because I think we, we all want to develop a, a, a good relations based on, on, on friendship, mutual respect and on common interests. And it is a two-way relationship. 
I think it's very important for the Arab world to have this relationship, but it's also equally important for the United States to have a good relationship with the Arab world. Mr. Ambassador, uh, on behalf of all of us uh, who are putting this conference on, we very much appreciate, sir, your taking time from what I know is a very busy schedule in light of what's going on in the world. And take as much time as you have uh, to join us uh, at our conference. We appreciate your candor. We appreciate uh, your expression of support for the United States and also pointing out those pitfalls that may lie ahead. So, sir, again, we appreciate your comments. We thank you for coming. And uh, we hope that you'll come down and do it again and join with us in another video.